This is Jewish Spotlight, a weekly television program presented by Chabad Lubavitch of Long Island, featuring various aspects of modern Jewish life and Jewish culture. Now, here is your host, Rabbi Tuvia Teldin. This is a situation that concerns every person around the world. And we in America have a very special perspective on that situation, which is for the most part presented to us by the media. Now, it's very easy just to take anything the media says on face value and to accept it as being the truth. But the fact is there have been cases over and over again, some of which we reported here in the Jewish Spotlight, where there's been a true misrepresentation of what the position of Israel is in that conflict in the Middle East. And as a result, there have been many people who over the last years have made a tremendous, very strong, sincere, and dedicated effort just to try to bring honest reporting to you, the viewer. So while you're sitting and watching television and innocently reading a newspaper and thinking you're getting all the facts, there's such a thing as becoming an educated consumer, of learning how to have a critical eye in terms of reading newspapers and understanding where perhaps the reporter is coming from, and in some cases actually where the newspaper editorial staff is coming from. And this is a very important point as far as how do we understand what exactly is going on in the Middle East. Now just to go into this topic, because it's such a very important topic and so important to us as, as democratic citizens in our free country to truly understand the reality of what's happening in the Middle East. I've asked somebody to come who's a very interesting young individual, a Jewish activist, 25 years old, who's dedicated his time and his energy to being able to spread some of the very important knowledge that we just talked about. It's my pleasure to have on the show Mr. Scott Mathias, who is the Director of Programming for an organization called HonestReporting.com. Scott, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. So tell me, first of all, how did you become such an activist in this particular issue? What is it that drives you and gives you such a passion to be able to to go out and really make this an issue that you want to dedicate so much time and effort to? Well. The way I see it, I feel that Israel's really facing two battles today. The one is the war on terror, which obviously we're all familiar with, uh, right. the military struggle, the IDF. Um, the second battle is really the war for public opinion, the battle in the media. Which way uh, is, is the press going to portray the Arab-Israeli conflict? How is the public then, in turn, going to receive that? And this really, in the end, will affect policy, as you can see, in negotiations between different countries, in America and Israel and um, the Palestinian Authority. Public opinion weighs a very big, um, you know, it has a, it's very important, I would say, in the policy that is made. Right. So in my decision, so how I could really make a difference, I felt that with the blatant media bias against Israel, if I could do something and actually make a difference, then we would really be doing a, a, a major, con be giving a major contribution to helping Israel and the Jewish people and, and ultimately the whole world to fight against terror. Very well put. Now, let me ask you a question. Do, are you, in your job working for honestreporting.com, you're involved specifically, I think, in, in working on a movie called Relentless, which we're going to get to in a couple minutes. An incredible movie, which I'm going to show a little bit of on the show, just to give people an idea of some of the footage that comes out of the Palestinian Authority about the situation with Israel. But in your personal work, do you go out to campuses? Do you go out and you speak to people? You're, you're interacting with people from the Jewish and non-Jewish community constantly. What kind of reaction do you get to the work that Honest Reporting is doing, and in general, people's feeling about the conflict in the Middle East? We've gotten uh, an extremely favorable response, both to Relentless, The Struggle for Peace in Israel, which is Honest Reporting's new documentary, and the work that Honest Reporting does. Um, the most common comment that I hear is, you know, what took you so long, and why isn't anyone else doing this? And it's really true that Israel does not have enough organizations and enough people and enough activists who are really trying to get the, the is Israelis' issues onto the table and really, uh, you know, to show and to correct the media when they're not giving an accurate portrayal. Yeah, it's very true. I'll tell you, and a Jewish spotlight would try to do, play our share in terms of really getting the message out, but I'm very happy that you came up with this film because what it does is it puts in a very professional, succinct way much of the footage that we've showed already on the show, but it gives in, in a context where the modern American audience can really relate to it and enjoy it, whether it be in their living room or out visiting some uh, organizational event where the, the show is taking place. 
Now, before we get to the show, though, if you could just describe for me what is honest reporting. I know it's, it's, uh, it probably sounds just like its name, but if you can give us a little more detail than that, I'd appreciate it. So honest reporting was started by five individuals um, a couple years ago when the, when the conflict had just re, uh, really had come and heated up again. Um, and Tovia Grossman, who is from Chicago, wound up on the front page of the New York Times. And there was a big headline that said that uh, an IDF soldier on the Temple Mount was beating up uh, a Palestinian, which was totally inaccurate. He was Jewish, this person that was bloodied on the cover of the New York Times, and this IDF soldier was saving his life from an angry mob of Arabs that were coming to kill him. Unbelievable. And this wasn't the first instance, obviously, of bias. And this was on the front cover. And finally, these people in Jerusalem said, we have to do something about it. And since then, now we have 60,000 subscribers to Honest Reporting. You Tremendous. can see how much just a few people can do when they put their minds together. And what they do is they take cases that are blatant uh, media bias against Israel and all forms of media and they put them in an email twice a week, and they send them out to their 60,000 subscribers and allow you in the email itself to respond to CNN and respond to the New York Times, to the producers and the editors, and say, we know that this is inaccurate, and we will discontinue our membership, and you should correct yourselves. And it really has made a world of difference, and I certainly encourage everyone that's watching the show to log on to our website at www.honestreporting.com and to become a member for free today. Sounds and you can great. get an email twice a week. Become an activist yourself. Exactly. It, it, puts, it makes it so easy to you. It comes to your computer, an email twice a week, and you can make a difference. So you become a media watcher, basically. Yeah. And in fact, you can become a media patroller and take on a newspaper like the New York Times and report back to Honest Reporting's headquarters if you see bias in the media. The right. 60,000 subscribers just get the emails from Honest Reporting and then respond to them. But if you see something or your local newspaper is consistently anti-Israel in their reporting, you know, join Honest Reporting not only as just a member, but be a media patroller, which is a, a whole other level where now you can report to Honest Reporting and you can, you're making an even bigger difference. Interesting. That's very interesting. Now tell me, in terms of Honest Reporting itself, do you feel that CNN and New York Times are really the two big guilty media corporations, because you mentioned them a couple of times, are they notorious for this? Are there other companies and other papers also that are well known for their bias? Well, uh, BBC, for instance, I know is one that's commonly. <laughs> right. Out. Now, I was, I was, when I was saying CNN and the New York Times, which are, you know, based in America, those continuously have been anti-Israel, but I think that Honest Reporting has done a very good job in making some headway. Um, to changing so their seen policies. Can we've you give us an example of that? We've certainly seen change. Um, the New York Times actually reported that Honest Reporting subscribers sent in so many emails on a consistent basis that they basically were not able to function. And I know, <laughs> really? yeah, I know personally where there's been cases where employees at CNN who are writers for the website put up something that's blatantly you know, not true about the conflict and someone at Honest Reporting will call a director or an editor over at CNN and he'll say, no, let us change it. Don't tell your subscribers. Um, it, you can tell it makes a difference and, and it's but important. Do you think that these reporters actually have a personal bias or that they're just in such a rush and there's so much pressure to be able to put out a story, they just put it out without really looking at the whole story? Yeah, so that's a very common question. You have to put yourself in their shoes to really understand it on a deeper level. They're being sent on assignment sometimes in a foreign country where they've never been. And I think, or I would like to think and judge favorably, that a large majority are just not informed about what's going on. They go straight into the West Bank. They never talk to anyone from Israel, which certainly is their fault to start with. But you know, the Palestinian Authority and Arafat give them a five-star hotel and show them around and suddenly they see what they think are injustices uh, in the West Bank where maybe people are not living under the best conditions. And right away they say, this is the D David, ironically, which is being beaten by the Israeli Goliath, but they don't take the time to learn the history. Mm -hmm. Now there is a whole separate group, which I am convinced that really do have an agenda. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly where it comes from, and I don't, I don't even want to make a guess. But on a consistent basis, after we've corrected them so many times, they just continue 
uh, on reporting that way. But the first group, wouldn't it be advantageous to really have an educational package or a training program for reporters before they go into Israel or a way of communicating with them so they'll be able to see both sides of the story before they get involved with it? Um, I think certainly it would be very advantageous for whatever media group is doing that. Now certainly there are groups out there such as Honest Reporting and Camera that are trying to educate them and do send, for example, we sent the film to many reporters and to many agencies and it has an effect but there's just kind of a feeling in the newsroom, for example, at CNN or some of the other places where sometimes um, you feel that the reporting is going one way and it naturally is going to affect you. Now, it, we don't want to necessarily beat up on the New York Times and CNN. There's many other places and, and other um, TV stations and other uh, newspapers which are not reporting accurately as well. You mentioned the BBC. The BBC is probably worse than all of them <laughs> combined. Um, and certainly the news media in Europe is atrocious. It's, it's much, much worse than a lot of what we see here in the Do States. Do you have subscribers in Europe? Yeah, we actually have the website in Italian. We actually have the website in Spanish um, and French. And so we have people that are pouring in their commentary on the bias that's going out there. Interesting. And relentless, people in Europe have been, it's the phones are off the hook really? because they really, really need it out there. Uh, the anti-Semitism is worse, the reporting is worse, and they see this as their tool to fight back and say, well, what about this? Okay, so let's get to Relentless. What exactly is it? Because I know you've been so dedicated in getting this out to the public. I want to hear about what the film is, and then soon we're going to show a little bit of the trail of that. Right. So Rafal Shore, who's a senior member at Honest Reporting, took it upon himself to make a PowerPoint presentation called Middle East Unplugged which he then turned into the film Relentless with, uh, with the help of Brian Spector and Wayne Copping, who were the producers. And instead of being reactive, which is what Honest Reporting was founded to do to respond to anti-Israel bias, now we're being proactive to show and put the issues on the table, um, which the Palestinians are so good at time and time again to say, this is, it's about the occupation and it's about the cycle of violence. And what about terror? And what about incitement? We never right. see that in the newspapers. So Relentless does just that through the prism of Oslo. It shows the commitments the Palestinians made and the commitments that the Israelis made. And it's very clear that the Palestinians didn't follow through on any of their commitments and the Israelis followed through on all of theirs. So looking to the future, we have to say, how serious are the Palestinians about peace before Israel starts making concessions? So Relentless is not necessarily talking about honest reporting. It has nothing to do with the media coverage. It just basically analyzes the Middle East conflict, takes it step by step, chronologically through the history of the peace process, and then shows why it's in the position and in the situation that it is. Right. It shows rare footage of Arafat speaking in English about detesting suicide Good. bombing. So before you get started, let's, <laughs> let's go over to that. If we could just switch over to that. We have about a minute and a half of film we want to show you, which some of which, in fact, as I mentioned, we have shown here on the Jewish Spotlight, but I'd like to show a little bit of Relentless so you can get an idea of what it's all about. The time for war was over. This is a time for peace. Young, edgy Israeli conscripts under orders to impose law and order. They merely further enslave the Palestinian people. Each Palestinian has his movements recorded on Israeli computers. <laughs> Okay, so we just had the 
place where people can get that also if they want to. How long is the film itself? 60 minutes. 60 minutes. And does Honest Reporting also provide a program, a speaker, if you, they want to have an organization to show this program? Have a 60-minute film, would you come out and speak for them as well? It, it depends on where it is. We average about an event every day. Really? Yeah, we have so many So there's such booked. a demand for you to come down to speak about this. Right. So we have members of Honest Reporting that can come, but we also have a script, which is nicely written, a 30-minute moderated discussion which you can use directly after the film. Interesting. And what kind of reactions are you getting in these presentations? Um, depending on the audience, people are normally just shocked and they think to themselves, why aren't we doing anything about this? This is terrible. Yeah. The fact is, as we spoke a little bit about before the show and as we've spoken about many times before, and this is a cultural problem. This is something that until that the, the culture of violence, the culture of terror and of suicide bombing is taken and uprooted and, and totally destroyed within the Palestinian society, is there hope? Now, there's a quote from John F. Kennedy at the beginning and the end of the film, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't know exactly, but he said, peace lies in the heart and minds of individuals, mm -hmm. meaning that you can write whatever type of peace agreement that you want, be it Oslo or Camp David or the roadmap, but until you have both sides that sincerely want peace, and their goal is peace and to end terror, then you have one side, the Israelis, that's going towards that end, and the Palestinians, which are basically making fa false promises, and, and it's going nowhere. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Scott, are you playing this for non-Jewish audiences as well? And if so, what kind of reaction are you getting? We're showing it to lots of non-Jewish audiences. We're showing it at churches, uh, movie theaters, and uh, we'd like to continue to do that. They are much more shocked on a consistent basis and appalled by what they see than Jews are. What is it that shocks people? What shocks people is how can this be happening that there's a society the, in, the, in the West Bank, the Palestinians, that are consistently brainwashing their people to hate Jews, to hate Americans, and to kill them wherever they can, and they're doing it so openly. Well, give us a couple of examples from the film as far as where that is shown. So P Itamar Marcus, who runs Palestinian Media Watch, translates um, every, uh, all the Palestinian television that goes on in the West Bank and Gaza. So in Relentless, you'll see that every Friday there's a sermon, and you'll see many clips of this, where you'll have a religious Muslim figure um, preaching, so to speak, in a mosque, and saying, you have to go out and slaughter the Jews. There was a clip of that just now that, you know, that your audience saw. Mm -hmm. And as far as the children? The children, you know, at the very end of the film, it says, and the hope is in the generation to come. And the incitement with the children, it's in every textbook. Israel doesn't exist. Um, and they're saying, basically, you need to go out and liquidate the Zionist presence, which is also in the Palestinian Authority's uh, covenant to this day. Tell me, you've been in Israel before. I, mean, I know you spent some time in yeshiva and the rabbinical school and studying Talmud in Israel. How do you react to Arabs and Palestinians that you are dealing with, that you're confronting? I don't know if you ever go into the areas where they're, quote unquote, the occupied territories, but does your background as far as being in honest reporting and knowing what you do about Jewish history and about the conflict, does it influence you as far as interacting in these areas? It influences me when I'm speaking with media because I know that so many instances where people were interviewed and the interview didn't come out as they had planned it because the, whatever the, the journalist was had their specific agenda. As far as speaking with Arabs or Palestinians themselves, I've heard so many stories where best friends, Israelis and Palestinians or Israeli Arabs living next to each other for years and the, the Palestinian or the Israeli Arab just killed the, 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 this Jewish person in cold blood. Come and on, it, and you, it's you've happened. Heard, you've heard many uh, stories like yes, that? Yes, 100%, where they were living side by side mm -hmm. um, in different cities in, without cause in or Israel. Without because of the political situation that we have now in the Middle East? Without, without any type of money gripe, there was no ulterior just motive. Because of the politics of the And times. the Jew, who was whatever his position was as a friend, was just in the house. And they, they planned him, c killed him in, in cold blood. And there are certainly instances of this that have happened well, I, time I and time that, again. Uh, our audience has to understand that as long as the attitude towards the Jews is that we are occupying what is considered to be sanctified Muslim territory, which is the way they look at that land, then according to some opinions within their religious belief system, 
we are infidels which must be destroyed. It doesn't make a difference if you're, in fact, a Jew, you're a non-Jew, whoever you are. If you're not a Muslim living on Muslim land, it's considered to be sacrilegious. So in this sense, this whole attitude, of course, it's very easy sometimes for an American to look at it as a distant problem, as a, a foreign problem. But we've only learned since 9-11 too, too much of a difficult way. And this is not just a Jewish situation. This is not just an anti-Semitic type of, of cause. This is anti-democratic. This is anti-freedom. This is anti-the West and anti-a whole culture because you're dealing with a cultural clash here where I, don't, I personally don't truly understand and I've studied it. And those who, who haven't studied it, it's even harder to understand how we're dealing with two such completely different cultures where the same word can mean two different things in these two different cultures and there's just a, a, a complete dichotomy of values. And it's scary, it's very, very scary. And it's hard to believe that in this day and age we live in a situation where we can have two societies that interpret situations, interpret circumstances so differently. Sure, and, and Relentless actually shows that towards the end of the really? film of 9-11 of and how the greater threat to the West. There's two terms. One is Dar al-Islam and one is Dar al-Kharav. Dar al-Kharav means house of the sword and Dar al-Islam means house of Islam. Now any place that is not conquered by Islam at this point is Dar al-Kharav and it's under the sword and, it's, and jihad is the means of acquiring that land. So certainly any country that's not Muslim falls under that category. Um, and you can see, though, however, that this is also latent with anti-Semitism, and we shouldn't forget that, that it's not just a religious Muslim issue. It's also anti-Semitism, because as you can see, there are plenty of devout Muslims who I've come across in Israel, outside of Israel, that aren't bent on killing Jews and aren't bent on ending society in the West. So you can see that there is something else going on there as well. Yeah, it's very interesting to note also that so much of the anti-Semitism that has been imported into the Middle East by the Arabs is really modeled on the anti-Semitic propaganda from World War II. And the, uh, the similarities are just uh, incredibly, I mean, they, they, they stare out at you and they're very scary, which gives us more reason to be afraid of what's going on over there, how something like this could really spread far beyond the borders of the Middle East. And we've seen how it has and it could continue to do so unless something is done. So this is why what you're doing is really so important to be able to get that word out there and to be able to to uh, impress upon people that we have to be educated consumers. We can't just rely on newspapers, on the television, on radio, and whoever it might be, and just say, okay, whatever we hear is, is the case. As our friend Sai Sim says, an educated consumer is, uh, is what we have to be. Yes. Is that, especially in something like this, which is so important to having a, a world view, it's, it's crucial. And our, our goal really in making Relentless was to provide an education to show what was Oslo, what was Camp David, um, and how can we understand the situation today from a more for informed perspective, but it's also to really create <coughs> activists. Take this film, show it to 10 friends and family, purchase it, you know, it's not expensive. Organize an event at your local organization, Jewish or non-Jewish, right. and you've just affected so many hundreds of people, and we've created probably the best activist tool out there for Israel, which just by sticking it in the VCR or your DVD player, 60 minutes later, you've affected people so easily and you don't have to know so much. Right. Now, Scott, let me ask you a question. You're a young fellow. You're, uh, you could go into campus probably a little bit easier than I could. You just graduated from the University of Wisconsin and you could really meet with students and they could relate to you, you could relate to them. When you go into that type of situation and you deal with students who perhaps maybe freshmen, sophomores, people who are really not too aware of what's going on in the Middle East. What kind of interaction is there? What kind of reaction do you get from them? So the number one thing that we are up against, it's really twofold, but I would say ignorance and apathy. People are just very uninformed because there's so much information out there and they're just being fed from these giant media machines what to think. And very quickly, if you can give a half an hour, a 60 minute class on what's actually going on, you change their opinions and they're much more well informed and now they're willing to act. And so in the very beginning, they say, I'll, either it's too confusing, there's nothing I can do, and the Palestinians are oppressed. And then you show them what actually happened. We didn't, the Israelis didn't steal any land. There isn't, these occupied territories don't exist. There's no cycle of violence. 
and really even, Israel, even the term Palestinian is a misnomer. That's true, 100%. And um, really, uh, Israel since day one has offered peace to the Arabs. And you know, for the last number of years and decades and hundreds of years, we haven't been offered peace in return. And when you present those facts through Relentless or going on campus, the students really do change their opinions and want to go out and make a difference. On the campuses that you've been to visit, have you noticed that there is a very strong liberal, left, pro-Palestinian move that makes it very difficult for Jewish students to stand up for what they believe in? On almost every campus, there is that contingent, and it varies based on campus how many are pro-Israel and how many are pro-Palestinian, but the ones in between will never take the side that they're supposed to, and they will never come out and fight for Israel, even though they may be Jewish, because they'll be embarrassed, or they don't they'll think they afraid. have the facts, or they're afraid, but once you give them the information they need, now they feel confident enough to go out and say, you know what, I always loved Israel, and I knew that they were on the side of the right, but now I know why, and so you're empowering them. Yeah, definitely, because they feel much more of a sense of self-confidence, <clears> and they can go out there and argue with the facts are prepared, especially with some of the professors pushing the Palestinian position. It makes it even more difficult as far as that's concerned. Very good. So I hope that some people will, in fact, call you and will invite you to come down and get you to sell more of the Relentless Films. If anybody's interested, they can, of course, get in touch with you. And your personal email, Scott? is Scott, S-C-O-T-T, at honestreporting.com. And you can call as well at 212 Nine two one nine zero nine zero to organize an event or to purchase the film, and I'll be happy to speak with each and every one of you. Okay, can you give us that phone number just one more time? Two one two nine two one nine zero nine zero, and my email is scott s c o t t at honestreporting dot com. Okay, and from what I recall, you're extension seventeen. I am extension seventeen. Very good. All right. Well, Scott, it's been a pleasure, and I want to thank you very much for being with us, and it's really wonderful to have a young Jewish activist on board, and it's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to see that you're getting out there and getting the message across. Meantime, I think it should be an inspiration to each and every single one of us to get this film, to learn more about the facts of what's going on in this conflict, to find out what's happening as far as the history behind this conflict, because there's so much history, and it's a very sad history. There's no secret about that. And we all want peace. There's no question about that. I think everybody in the world wants there should be peace in the Middle East, but it has to be a true peace. It has to be an honest peace. It has to be a peace based on an acceptance by both nations and both peoples of each other. There could be disagreements. There could be all types of, of uh, feelings of, uh, of just different cultures. However, when it comes down to it, a culture of violence, a culture of revenge, a culture of hatred is not a culture that anybody can live with. And God forbid we should ever experience in the States what they're going through in Israel, what they have suffered in Israel, as far as the, 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 the types of murders and the types of campaigns that have gone through the terror. It's an absolute travesty. Let's hope and pray that thing, things will get better for all of humanity. We should see you next week, same time, same station. Shalom.